Yes. So you're the moderator. Uh, I'm not the moderator. I'm replacing because they're stuck in the line. Okay, so, so this you know, is the... the Good morning, everyone. So it's 3rd of December, and the marath marathon continues. Uh, so uh, today we are having a, a side event, which is the most important at the United Nations Social Conference uh, 28, uh, focusing on, on the decade. So, uh, and uh, this, this uh, event will have several sessions. It will start at 9.30. Now it's, it's of course, uh, th three minutes uh, late, as always. Uh, finished at noon, there will be questions and answer sessions. So, uh, you know, um, and, and the, the organization of the session is the following. We are going to have two keynote speeches. After that keynote speeches, we can have a Q&A session. And then we are going to have two panels. And then, uh, this is basically what I'm supposed to say. And, and this is who, who I'm not, because, you know, the moderator is stuck in the line uh, together with the other moderator, so I'm replacing them. <laughs> but, you know, this is normal for the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. We are all in one boat. So, uh, and I don't know what, is, what comes next. Ah, so this is opening <laughs> remarks. <laughs> so opening remarks. So now uh, this, is, this is the real business, opening remarks. Um, you know, uh, first of all, I would like to say that in 2015, we had the toughest negotiations when the Paris Agreement was signed. Uh, the, the, I think the time was basically uh, uh, focusing on, on the hiatus in, in the global warming. Uh, there was some slowdown of the temperatures, and it was used by deniers to say that, you know, there is no more global warming. It's all in the past. So actually, what was happening is that it was the development of Argo Boys led to uh, analysis of how much heat is redistributed in the ocean. It was shown clearly that the heat is now going down. That, uh, the surface of the ocean is uh, slowing, uh, uh, the, the, the growth of temperature is slowing down, but the heat continues, the process continues. This was very important politically to, to first of all, to explain the role of the ocean, to explain the role of science, and also to, to achieve the Paris Agreement. Now, uh, in the Paris Agreement, uh, we are... And in 2015, ocean was only included in the preamble of the, of the Paris Agreement. It was already a moment for celebration for many people, uh, uh, particularly ocean climate platform and many people around this. Uh, and, and that was very important. Now we need to move forward. forward. Uh, basically, ocean is able to uh, help reduce uh, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere by 35% in sustainable way. And this is basically the conclusion with which we can move forward. Uh, you know, but the situation in the ocean, and this is my usual mantra, sorry if you heard it three to four times. So ocean is a sick patient. Ocean uh, has many diseases, uh, and many good doctors treat the ocean. The problem is that they don't speak to each other. And, you know, a convention on climate, convention on biological diversity, some activities related to, uh, I would say, uh, food and things. So everything uh, is basically uh, happening in the ocean. So we need to treat the ocean in a very, I think, uh, holistic way. And the way forward is definitely sustainable ocean management that is based on science. So with that, there is a big possibility to contribute to all these uh, all these areas of benefit, like climate, biodiversity, food, uh, economy, uh, also security. And we have to develop all of this. So in the decade of ocean science, uh, there are several challenges, 10 challenges. Challenge number five is the challenge focused on the uh, ocean and climate nexus. And there are already some uh, good developments there, several programs. 
Uh, unfortunately, Julian and Alice would, would, would have been able to give you I think, more information about this. But I think uh, what, what uh, the process of development of the decade is such that we started a big public movement. This is the largest undertaking in the history of ocean sciences ever. Uh, and you know, but this is mostly uh, something that we acquire according to how we see, uh, we see the relevance of certain proposals to the goals of the ocean decade, to sustainable uh, sustainability related to the ocean. Um, now the time has come to uh, start analyzing where we are, where are the gaps, how we can accelerate certain things, how we can move together towards uh, consolidating results. This is, the, uh, the, uh, um, this is going to be assisted by the process which is called Vision 2030. There are going to be 10 papers uh, prepared by on, on different decade challenges, including uh, one on, on the ocean climate nexus. Then there will be a synthesis paper. And we will move forward. Uh, the Barcelona conference that is going to be on the decade is going to be at the beginning of April. Will be very, very important. There will be uh, a, a presentation of uh, more or less all activities, so people will be able to see uh, where we are, how we can move forward. Uh, but we wish to, to basically create conditions for for a successful conference in Barcelona and moving forward to the year 2030. And today we are going to have two presentations that are going to help us with this. One presentation will be given by um, uh, Margaret Leinen, the uh, director of the Scripps Institution for Oceanography, uh, and uh, a key person who was uh, leading the decade construction from, from the outset. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, the, and the second presentation will be by uh, Nailo D, uh, who is uh, uh, vice, uh, well, you know, I don't know your precise name, but you know the, your coordinator of the Ocean and Climate Dialogue. So the person who is basically translating uh, uh, the advances in the ocean uh, decades into the fabrics of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So these two presentations are incredibly important uh, because we are going to see what the decade can do and how we can translate it into, into discussions uh, uh, on the oceans. Ocean is now firmly in the UNFCCC. Uh, many countries know that their contributions, national, national determined contributions, can really help uh, uh, the climate debate, but they don't know how. Now the time is uh, for us to help them to make sure that ocean is really contributing. So that's what it is. This is Julian Barbier, and this is the, and this is Alison Closen. I think you know. Look at them. I think they they, they just have beaten records on, on running inside UNFCCC. Julian, the work is done. Just relax, and the word the word goes to Margaret. Margaret. So if I didn't make any mistake, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> All right. Right. So Margaret Leinen, so Margaret, you know, uh, so the, the uh, counterintuitive thing is that this is uh, uh, the button that takes things f I have forward. No slides. Oh, you have no slides. Wonderful. I, for I forgot about that. Sorry. <laughs> oh, got, got. All right. So all good. All good. Margaret, either this or that. I don't know. Uh, I think this is good. Then you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you can tell we're we're adjusting on the fly here. Um, I was asked, uh, so uh, uh, Julian was going to tell you a bit about the, the progress of the decade, and, uh, and he, he probably still will when he catches his breath. Uh, and I was asked to talk a little bit and reflect about what, what some of the gaps are. What, now that we've, uh, we've uh, accumulated these 40-some decade-long programs within the, the ocean decade and more than 200 projects, what are some of the things that we still are going to need to do in order to achieve that leap to sustainability uh, that the decade uh, aims to do? And my thinking on this is a little bit different. I, I'm not going to talk about gaps in the sense of, oh, we need to know about the coral reefs in this area of the ocean or that, that thing. But really how we take all of this information that we're generating and make a substantive leap toward integrative knowledge 
being able to answer the questions like, how is climate change changing the trophic cascade in the ocean, and will that affect our ability to continue to feed 2 billion people who depend on seafood protein as their primary source of protein? That's an incredible span of, of questions to address. And I think that that is the piece that, that we're struggling with. And I think there are, there are a couple of challenges that we need to meet over the decade to get there. And one of them is to be able to connect that wealth of observation that we're, we're making to do something really synthetic and integrative with it. In, in business, uh, people talk about capitalizing on the internet of things in order to run their companies more intelligently, in order to uh, you know, uh, really capitalize on the sensing capability that's out there. Uh, here on land, we can do that because we have the internet. Uh, and, and that is really based on the, the capability of communicating with the electromagnetic spectrum. That doesn't work in the ocean. The, the way that we can transfer information easily in the ocean is acoustically, but the bandwidth of that is very low. So how do we get all of those sensors that we have in the ocean to be able to interoperate, to talk to each other, to gather that? And that's a challenge that we have yet to meet. And I think that we need to be thinking a little differently about it. There are a lot of ideas about doing things like connecting instruments to seafloor sea cables or having moorings that, that uh, sensors could come up to, release uh, data to uh, um, a data collector on the mooring and then transfer it up. We're not thinking about how to bring all of that together in a way that would allow us to have all of our sensors for the physics of the ocean talking to our sensors for the biology of the ocean. And I think that by the end of the decade, we really need to be able to have that capability. Along with that is the capability of really capitalizing on artificial intelligence. And here, uh, you know, at, at my university, um, everybody talks about using artificial intelligence to, um, you know, to summarize a meeting easily or to, um, to look things up easily. But the capability is so much greater than that. And in other fields, for example, in biotechnology, uh, they're using artificial intelligence to develop whole new streams of of uh, inquiry that that uh, that capitalize on bringing from other fields into uh, biotechnology and using artificial intelligence in that way uh, to really advance the science as opposed to summarizing science. And I think that that's an area where we really need to be. Uh, coordinating with other fields to understand how to use the power of this uh, so that we can get to those big questions, uh, to be able to even address the big questions. There are a few other things that we really can't do yet that I think are going to be uh, really important for the future. One of them is to really comprehensively track carbon in the ocean. So. We know that, that the carbon system is changing uh, with, with all of the CO2 that's in the atmosphere. We know that people are talking about using uh, uh, techniques to move carbon around uh, in the ocean. We know that people are talking about carbon removal from the atmosphere. But as soon as we remove carbon from the atmosphere, the ocean, which is then going to be out of equal, well, it's out of equilibrium now, but we'll be even further out of equilibrium, we'll start degassing CO2. So how will we know what progress we've made in the carbon system if we're not 
monitoring that in the ocean. And we just don't have the, the carbon tracking system and the carbon capa monitoring capabilities now that are going to be necessary for that. And I think that that is an, a major capability that we need to develop in the decade and deliver by the end of the decade so that uh, in answer to uh, uh, Peter Thompson's uh, challenge about do we know enough to make decisions about climate intervention or geoengineering, we're going to have to have that carbon tracking system to do that. Finally, I think that one of the areas that is changing most rapidly and that we're really not in a position uh, to, uh, to really look at in a comprehensive way is the poles. We know that, that the big action and the big change is taking place in the Arctic and the Antarctic. But they're very tough logistically, and they cost a lot of money to look at. And so our, although we have ambitions to look at them, we don't have the resources. We're looking at the possibility that in the 2030s that we'll experience an ice, summer ice-free Arctic for the first time. We haven't seen that in millions of years. We have no idea what the implications of that will be because we don't have the ability right now to look at and track the changes that are taking place in the fringes of the Arctic and in the physics. So we're going to have to begin to monitor the Arctic in, in a much more comprehensive way and in a way that will be challenging technologically, but absolutely is going to be essential for us to be able to tell people what to anticipate. In the Antarctic, it's really the question of uh, the grounding of the ice sheets and the, the extreme technological challenge of being able to observe under the ice sheets to the places where they're, they're anchored uh, at, on the bottom of the ocean. And both, of, both the Arctic and the Antarctic are huge technological challenges that we need the resources to do. They're not, they're not impossible in terms of the technology, but the resources are, are, uh, are a real obstacle there. In the case of sort of the ocean internet of things and AI, it's, it's really a, a, a change in our way of looking at the problems that is the big challenge. So a technological set of challenges and a, a heuristic set of challenges or a synthetic set of challenges. Both of these are not ones that we're seeing proposals for from the decade. And I think that we need to raise the ambition of the scientific community uh, to propose these really challenging issues and really challenging uh, problems in order to take all of what we do see for the, the that is being generated during the decade uh, to make an e even bigger leap, an even more transformative capability. And, and again, the, it, the issue is being able to really address big questions like understanding how the ocean is going to change and what its implications are for our economies, for our food security, for our adaptability. And uh, uh, so uh, this is out of order with, the, with Julian's presentation, but one of the things that uh, we really hope that the next group of people that, that are working on the decade will start thinking about. Thanks. Thank you very much, Margaret, and uh, good morning, colleagues. Sorry for being a little bit late. My mother would say, you'd be late for your own wedding. She never mentioned a COP event, my own COP event. But uh, uh, anyway, here, here we are. Uh, thank you, Margaret, for, for this quite visionary um, you know, understanding of what are some of the gaps that we have, but maybe where we need to go in the, in the decade. And, and certainly, uh, 
you know, we, we want to use this opportunity here at the COP to, to, to raise awareness about, of course, the framework of Educate, but help us to set the bar and the ambition of where we need in terms of knowledge generation and, and science uh, in, by, by the end of 2030. But of course, uh, there are different steps to get there and, and we'll, we'll go through some of this uh, today. So I, I think we're going to go straight to our next speaker. So Margaret, and also let me also highlight that Margaret has been leading, uh, co-chairing the Decade Advisory Board for over uh, almost, what, three years now from the start, and previously was also uh, one of the members that actually set up the Decade uh, through the, the planning group that was established uh, before the year uh, 2000. So Margaret highlighted some of the science challenges. Uh, we're now going to talk a little bit about the, uh, the policy and how we bring the ocean issues into the uh, UNFCC framework. Um, and really talk about uh, you know the, the status of ocean science uh, within this UNFCC process. We have now uh, for since Glasgow, and we have a decision of Glasgow that's now put in place this regular dialogue on ocean and climate uh, issues. And we have a pleasure of having with us uh, Niall Odi, who is the co-facilitator of this ocean and climate change dialogue, and also senior assistant deputy minister uh, at the Department of Fisheries and Ocean Canada. So uh, Niall, floor is yours. Okay, hey, many thanks, and uh, it's great to, to be with you all uh, to share a few thoughts on how the Ocean Decade um, and uh, community and its partners can engage with uh, the UNFCCC process uh, through the Ocean Climate Dialogue. So really honored to, to have a few moments with you here today. And, uh, great to hear Margaret's thoughts on what some of those science agendas are. Um, I, I'll probably start with, uh, I do have a, a doctor before my name, but I'm at this stage probably a lapsed scientist, trained as one, but have been working in policy for too long to claim that anymore. So it's uh, but nice to be among old friends. Um, before I dive in, I would also like to thank uh, the uh, IOC uh, for hosting the event, uh, as well as for their leadership of, uh, of the Ocean Decade. It really is making a strong and positive impact on uh, the, the evidence base for sustainable ocean management. And from a, kind of wearing a Canadian hat, we very much appreciate our, our opportunity to participate uh, in that. Um, Turning to the UNFCCC, of course, the, the main international platform for addressing uh, the climate crisis, uh, the processes under the UNFCCC are really vital for connecting our understanding of climate actions uh, to the actions that can address, or climate change to the actions that can address its impacts. And the body of knowledge on the impacts of climate change does continue to grow every day, uh, and that's driven by efforts of scientists like those in this room, uh, the observation networks we have access to, and uh, the scientific research by organizations and thousands of, of scientists who work around the world to do it. In the UNFCCC structure, uh, the subsidiary body for scientific and technological advice provides um, support for the work of the convention uh, through the provision of that scientific advice based on research analysis and analysis as well as on uh, in, uh, earth and uh, ocean observation work. So the substance work is key to providing uh, expert advice uh, to inform the policy work of the convention. And collaboration and information exchange among scientists who participate in multidisciplinary working groups results in the promotion of new approaches to research and systematic observation of the climate system that really are major contributors to uh, I'll carry on. Okay. <clears throat> Just a, a brief reminder of the climate emergency, I think. Um, so, uh, turning back to um, my thoughts here. So, I think um, in 2019 in Glasgow, the Ocean Climate Dialogue 
was established to provide a specific forum uh, for enhancing the understanding of the ocean and climate nexus and promoting action under the UNFCCC process. So really what it is, is is a place within the formal UNFCCC process where those scientific inputs, knowledge and practical um, advice and information can feed into the UNFCCC's uh, negotiating processes. And this year, uh, when we met in Bonn in June, we focused on two key topics. One was uh, ecosystem restoration, so co coastal ecosystem restoration, including blue carbon. And the second was fisheries and food security. Um, in those that context, we heard that uh, significant knowledge gaps prevent ocean indicators from being more widely and effectively included in UNFCCC processes, including particularly in uh, nationally determined contributions. Carbon cycling, for example, is one area where increased scientific understanding would support decision making. Um, increased ocean-based systematic observation and additional research and modeling as well as standardized data and knowledge systems must be shared openly uh, to broaden familiarity with these concepts for the future of adaptation. And I think the, the work of the Ocean Decade in providing the information supports to the UNFCCC process via the dialogue to that end help to really mainstream uh, what we see as, as uh, tools, uh, so scientific tools that support a policy process and actually support concrete adaptation and mitigation ad uh, actions on the ground. On the topic of coastal ecosystem restoration and blue carbon, uh, we heard that integrating mitigation and adaptation considerations for coastal ecosystems into policy and management practices at both national and regional uh, levels, including in the nationally determined uh, contributions and national adaptation plans, can really help to signal government priorities and particularly help to mobilize finance. So how we get the investments in these areas is by having the scientific evidence to support it. And they also help to better streamline national focus areas within other international conventions and agreements. And that question of interlinkage among these various processes, particularly with the Kunming Montreal Biodiversity Framework, are increasingly critical. We heard that it's essential for parties to strengthen blue carbon accounting methodologies and tools. And Margaret spoke a little bit about that carbon tracking and how important that is. So that's both at that broadest systematic observation level, but also more particularly uh, for specific projects. And that means things like natural capital accounting, ecosystem mapping, and robust indicators that need to be in support. It exists and be advanced to support ocean climate actions uh, and also their monitoring and evaluation for effectiveness. Through the dialogue, uh, it was also highlighted uh, that sustainable management of coastal ecosystems and recognition at local, national, and international levels of their direct benefits beyond that of mitigation is really needed. And that requires building awareness and advancing data-driven approaches to understand, demonstrate, and quantify the benefits that are resulting. And further, the assessment of blue carbon storage potential and carbon dioxide removal technologies, the extent of ocean acidification, and the need for vulnerability assessments were identified as requiring further observation and research. The dialogue also really emphasized the critical need to break down barriers and foster collaboration among policymakers, experts, and organizations, as well as the private sector, uh, which strongly aligns, I think, with a key principle of the ocean decade that to drive effective ocean-based climate solutions requires reducing duplication and fully integrating ocean goals into national climate priorities. Um, I really think that the Ocean Climate Dialogue, as well as events such as this one, offer us a pretty unique opportunity to foster that alignment across organizations and start to share a common sense of urgency, ambition, and ambition around the specific areas of research advancement that are required to make this work move forward more rapidly. There are many um, opportunities for the decade community and partners to engage in the UNFCCC process and in the Ocean Climate Dialogue itself. Uh, the global stock take, as has been noted, taking place here at COP28 provides an opportunity to acknowledge the impact of climate change on our oceans and to highlight the importance of the oceans in responding to climate change. And one of the key messages that we take to this COP is that integrating ocean into the global stock take is one of our primary, uh, one of the primary emergency, emerging messages and one of the most important things that needs to happen over these next couple of weeks. 
because when that happens, it helps to ensure that when countries in the next very short couple of years are developing revised nationally determined contributions and national adaptation plans, that they feel better equipped to include and incorporate ocean-related actions uh, in those, uh, those exercises and those reporting and accountability documents. Um, that provides us the means to then further demonstrate the impact and, and contribution of the ocean to climate change uh, and help build its role and its centrality in the UNFCCC process. So from this community, as the Ocean and Climate Dialogue proceeds, we'll continue to seek the views, experiences, and recommendations from this community uh, and really look forward to engaging with you further when we meet once again in Bonn uh, in June uh, and in the lead up to that in our consultations on the topics for the upcoming dialogue. So with that, I'll thank you and turn it over to our moderator. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Odi, for spelling out really the, uh, you know, some of those challenges and this, this very important dialogue that we now have secured and, and which is happening on a regular process, both in terms of defining some of the asks from the science that we need to address within the ocean decade but also really trying to see how we can, we can bring this body of knowledge within the, the negotiation process and within the, the whole UNFCC framework, particularly looking at the, the national level and how to integrate some of those issues within, within the NDCs. And also this call for engagement uh, through the global stack, uh, stack, um, stack, stock. stock taking, I always get it wrong, that one, um, process, which is, uh, which is also uh, being discussed here at, at COP. So I think we, it's a good start. We have a science, we have a policy, the interaction between science and policy. Um, and this whole uh, event is, as we put it together with Alison, uh, uh, we really also wanted to give the opportunity to start showing some of the actions uh, that the ocean decade is now uh, you know, implementing. We have a, an ecosystem of uh, about 50, 50 programs now in place, uh, 280 projects. Uh, they're all addressing you know, the 10, decay challenges, but we wanted to highlight in particular those that are focusing on this ocean climate nexus and, uh, and give you a, an opportunity to really understand uh, how those, uh, those, 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 those actions are really generating new knowledge, but not just new knowledge. It's also about solutions. It's also about informing policy processes and working in this co-design approach, working with end users and, and stakeholders in actually identifying the research questions uh, from the start in, in, in this co-delivery uh, process. So it's my pleasure to uh, invite a, a panel of uh, representing some, uh, some of those uh, most relevant uh, ocean climate decade actions uh, to the floor. So let me list the names. Uh, we have uh, Théophile Bongart. Is Théophile with us? Yes. Um, we have Lisa, Lisa Levin. I thought I saw Lisa somewhere. Yes, she's here. Yeah. Okay. We have Philippa Carvalho. Uh, Philippa, yeah, please, please take a seat. Uh, we have Bill Austin. Where is Bill? It's Bill, yes, Bill is on his way. All right. We have Nancy Jiao. I saw. Yes, well, he's here with us. Uh, then we have Steve, Steve Widdecombe, and uh, we have Zen Sun. Do we have enough seats? Can we put uh, maybe one, one chair? One chair there. Ah. And there's Alexis. Uh, the last one. Is yes, Alexis Crosskop. Let's get another chair. Okay, we have perfect. Well, uh, luckily we're not invited all 50 uh, decade programs to join today. Uh, we, that's why we had to be selective. But anyway, I think you'll get a good uh, a good panel. Oh. Okay, so in that little uh, uh, short session that we have, I think we, we asked our, our colleagues to address one particular question, which is what is a key science policy society, society gap uh, that is being addressed by your specific uh, decade action? So uh, let's, uh, let's hear from them. And uh, first on the list is Theophil about the CITES initiative. 
Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everyone. Very happy to be uh, with you and to hear about all the projects uh, funded by the, supported by the, the UN Decade. So I'm here to talk about an initiative called uh, Cities, which is uh, focusing on uh, how coastal cities can impact on one of the consequences of uh, climate change, which is a uh, sea level rise. And I think we are endorsed by the, uh, the UN Decade because this initiative uh, is really uh, working with scientists and policymakers to produce and deliver concrete policy recommendations. So I want to present you uh, one document uh, where we are uh, presenting uh, solutions, uh, talking about knowledge uh, and uh, how we can adapt coastal cities. On the methodology, what is interesting, I think, is that we we first uh, wanted to work with scientists and we gather a wide range of international scientists um, with a very multidisciplinary approach of what could be a sustainable way to adapt uh, coastal cities. And that was really the start of the, of the project, to, in a second time, be able to work with practitioners on the ground and organize a series of different workshops that are here on the slide. And we had uh, five different regional workshops. So with practitioners, we are people who are implementing concrete projects, also with scientists. And we went in different regions in the world, in, uh, in Marseille, in the Mediterranean, in, uh, in US West Coast, in Santa Cruz, in Dakar, Senegal, West Africa, in the Pacific to understand how coastal islands can adapt to sea level rise in Fiji. And uh, we had more than 230 participants uh, participating to this uh, initiative and, uh, and discussions to uh, finally produce different reports and uh, finally policy recommendation. And so that's uh, these documents uh, on the next slide. You can uh, have it with a QR code and uh, read it online. But I have a lot of different other that I can, I can share with you. It's just uh, a teasing of what is inside uh, this, uh, this document. Very beautiful and, and light, but dense in the, in the content. And so um, we have four priorities to adapt coastal cities. The first one is on solution and how we will have to combine different solutions considering that each city is unique, uh, but they will have to choose what they want to protect from rising sea level and where they want to manage to retreat. A second point on social justice, which is of course key and it was in absolutely all workshops, the main discussion on how we can integrate other uh, and a wide range of stakeholders to be sure we will not lead to maladaptation, to climate gentrification, and how adaptation is not um, raising and exacerbating inequalities. And that's true for sea level rise adaptation, but for all other kinds of adaptation. Uh, a third priority is on knowledge, and we call it knowledge and not just science as it has to uh, to, um, to, to, to work on how we can better collect data and observation data, but also uh, work with all the local knowledge and know-how, of course. And, uh, but really, the, the paper is proposing solutions to present how we can do it and how we can engage more different communities. Uh, a last point on uh, finance, and uh, there is many different uh, topics to, uh, to raise more funds and finance cost adaptation, which will cost a lot. But the main idea is that we'll have to uh, engage funders on a long-term approach because adaptation will have to fund it now, but for the whole century. And so that's really the, 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 the key point of this document. Last, because we are at COP, there is also in this document a call for action where we are uh, addressing those recommendations and translating those recommendations in a way that policymakers, that negotiators and parties can use it in the negotiation. Uh, for instance, how uh, sea level rise can be included in the loss and damage uh, discussions and in the global goal for action, which priorities we can, which key action we can, uh, we can identify and, uh, and include in this uh, document. Next step, um, one month ago, a coalition of cities uh, were announced and it will be launched at the UNOC, the UN Ocean Conferences in Nice in 2025. And this coalition will be hosted by the mayor of Nice. Um, it has been a, a mandate, mandate, he has been mandated by the president of France. And so in this coalition, of course, uh, the question of the knowledge and how the mayors can access, access uh, knowledge will be key. And so uh, with the IOC and other partners, we are committed to uh, structuring this, uh, this coalition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Theophile.
and, and, and let me also recognize the Ocean and Climate Platform, which, is, uh, which has been designing and implementing this initiative. I think it's very important for the DK to work at very le different level of, uh, of governance and implementation, and, and local government cities is such an essential scale where we need to really deliver uh, science solutions, and uh, we certainly will also be discussing some of these issues at the Barcelona conference and then, of course, uh, in Nice. So from the coastal cities to the, uh, the deep ocean, my pleasure now to give uh, uh, the floor to uh, Professor Lisa Levin, who is uh, uh, a professor emerita at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography in San Diego to talk about the deep ocean observing strategy. Over to you, Lisa. Okay, thank you. Um, I thought I had pop-ins, but it's all on, it all shows up here. Um, so uh, yes, let's talk about the deep ocean. We know we have all, of, and I'm, I'm not going to stick to only one problem because all these problems show up in the deep ocean. We have major planetary crises. We have a food crisis. We have an energy crisis. We have waste crises. We have health crises and biodiversity crises on this planet and, um, and in the ocean. And as we deplete our resources on land, we move into the shallow ocean. But in many cases, we have depleted resources in the shallow ocean, and now we are moving into the deep ocean. And this is true for food, where we now have deep sea fisheries that are very common, thousands of meters. This is true for energy, where we now exploit and extract oil and gas at thousands of meters increasingly, unfortunately. Um, we, uh, this is true for waste, where we're now looking to the deep ocean as the disposal site for our excess carbon dioxide, among, and it also receives our plastics and other contaminants. This is true for health, where we definitely need new antibiotics and new pharmaceuticals, and we're now bioprospecting in the deep ocean. And um, this is true for biodiversity, where we have biodiversity loss on land, but we also have it in the ocean, and we are running the risk of biodiversity loss in, and in the deep ocean, where we have yet to characterize the biodiversity. So we have all of these problems. And then we, of course, need to understand the deep ocean to detect and project climate change. The deep ocean is most of the ocean, okay? We're talking about below 200 meters. It's, it's like 95 per, more than 95% of the ocean. And we can't do a good job of our climate models unless we observe the deep ocean. Oh, let's see. I guess my second slide did I not show up. Um, that's a shame. Okay, it's about the deep ocean observing strategy. Is there no second slide now? No. Let me just make sure I, I will just talk. Let no. me have uh, oh, that's wonderful. a piece of paper with my note. All right, so the deep ocean observing strategy is a, um, Go back. A community-driven international initiative that strategically aligns the deep ocean observing community towards collective solution-based science. And it is observing, but it is also exploration, and it is also modeling. So what are we doing to address these crises? We have uh, essential ocean variables that we are looking at. Um, New, there are some that are very specific to the deep ocean or we need new specs and we work with Goose to develop these. Methane is, is one example, but there, there are many in the physics, biogeochemistry and ecology realm. We're working on benthic ecology EOVs. We uh, look at observational gaps and modeling synergies and we've just concluded an analysis of all the low confidence statements related to the deep sea and AR6. I have a QR code for the report on that if information sheet if anybody would like to get it from me. We are looking, um, we have a group working on surface to deep ocean connections and another group doing simulation experiments to decide where deep Argo should go, where we should be making measurements in the deep sea. We are very focused on developing global capacity. I think in a previous session you heard most of the ocean observations are in the north. The south doesn't make them, and that's especially true, or as many, for, for the deep sea. 
I'm sorry. I'm running, I'm running through everybody's slides. Um, um, and so, so we are working with Ocean Discovery League to develop low cost and deep technologies that can be used in, in the, um, the, the uh, southern hemisphere, well, in, in all countries, but especially developing uh, and middle income countries. We are working on data accessibility, which is also a big issue for capacity development and making the ocean accessible to everybody. And we have a whole fair data team focused on the deep sea. We have a program called Doers, Deep Ocean Early Career Researchers, where we have 120 early career scientists from around the world. I had a map up that showed all the countries they're from um, to help develop leaders in deep ocean observing. We have a habitat mapping program um, that is characterizing and allowing everybody to explore their own deep sea. See me again for a great QR code for a really fun app if you want to find out how much deep sea is in your country and what depths it's at. Um, and then we work very much bringing the deep sea observing to policy and try to, uh, we work with the Deep Ocean Stewardship Initiative and attending meetings like this and uh, UN Ocean Conferences and NJ agreements in any place where the deep sea is relevant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elisa. <laughs> and apologies if we, we lost one of your slides. Uh, I think we, what we'll do is certainly, if all of you agree, we will put those slides on our Ocean Decade website. There's a specific page for this event, and, and everybody will be able to, to access this. Uh, and indeed, Ocean observations, particularly in those deep areas, is so important uh, in light of a BBNJ agreement, which has, you know, has been uh, adopted by member states. So we really need strong science and observations to, to underpin the implementation of that agreement. So now we're going a little bit higher in the water column. We're going to talk uh, a little bit uh, about a, also an area where we, we don't talk that much. And this is the, the twilight zone. So it's my pleasure to invite uh, Philippa Carvalho who is with the National Oceanography Center in the UK, to talk about JETSON, the Joint Exploration of a Twilight Zone Ocean uh, Network. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Julian. So, um, so I'm here to talk about JETSON. Like you said, it's, it's about the joint exploration of the Twilight Zone uh, Ocean Network. And because it's a full mouth um, acronym, we'll, I'll just use JETSON um, as I talk about it. So what is a Twilight Zone? Um, the Twilight Zone is also known as the mesoplogic, that's a technical term, um, and basically it encompasses this ecosystem uh, that spans globally across all oceans between 200 and about 1,000 meters. Um, and it's probably one of the lesser known, but also one of the most exciting and really important ecosystems full of life. Um, so it contains one of the largest um, yet least exploited um, fish stocks anywhere on the planet. Um, it's also where the world's largest migration happens on a daily basis, uh, where uh, plankton and fish migrate from the mesopelagic, from the twilight zone towards the surface um, to feed and then come back during um, uh, daytime to avoid predation. And it actually plays a huge role in uh, regulating recycling nutrients and carbon, um, which is going to fuel the entire ocean ecosystem from the surface all the way to the bottom of the ocean, so the benthos. Um, and so this all comes together in uh, what we call the biological carbon pump, which is an essential component to the carbon cycle. Um, and the twilight zone has been largely neglected until uh, fairly recently, but now we're starting to draw increasing attention uh, to the region. Um, and obviously, there will come uh, multiple stresses uh, with, with this attention. So climate change is here. Everyone knows um, it's already hitting us. Uh, but there's also some increasing awareness from the uh, fishing uh, industry that there's this largely untouched, um, huge stock that is ready to be uh, exploited. Um, there's also threats from deep sea mining, for example, where the, with the potential of um, releasing materials from, from the extractions in mid-water column. Uh, 
Um, there's also, in terms of the carbon dioxide uh, removal strategies, uh, most of the uh, current um, projected marine CDR uh, methods actually aim to stimulate components of this biological carbon pump uh, to try to make the ocean more efficient at uptaking more carbon um, and storing it for a larger amount of time. But we don't know how these activities are going to, uh, or the impact of those activities are going to have uh, in the twilight system um, and how it's going to affect the processing of the carbon um, in, in the ocean interior, um, and especially at this global scale. So Jetson uh, sort of aims to try to fill this gap by trying to create a benchmark um, of this biological carbon pump, which will then allow us to understand the role of the ocean, and in particular, the, the ocean biota in the carbon cycle, which then will allow us to understand the effects uh, or the impacts of in the, within the future climate uh, scenarios. And then in a later stage, try to understand the impact of all these activities that are starting to hit uh, the mesopelagic, the twilight zone, um, to try to understand what we can and can't do before we ruin <laughs> the ocean. Um, the majority of the Twilight Zone actually lies beyond national um, borderlines or uh, the EZs. Uh, in fact, most of it is in international waters. And so in order to um, inform a sustainable future, we really need to cooperate internationally um, and in an inclusive, in an inclusive way. Um, and so the aim of Jackson is exactly that, to try to sustainably um, engage um, the community uh, for uh, this critical uh, ecosystem. So Jetson uh, brings, together, uh, brings together over um, 20 projects, uh, over 400 people uh, interested in uh, the Twilight Zone, um, aiming to try to share data, to establish and share best practices, um, to share resources and capabilities, and importantly, trying to compile uh, and share the knowledge that each individual project which focuses on one particular part of the ocean um, to try to create this um, large uh, global but comparable data set because of the best practices, which then allows us to look holistically at um, the, the twilight zone as sort of a, a global integrated system, which is really what we need. Um, and this way, we're actually leveraging small pots of money from the individual nations and maximizing the, the scientific information to, to, to stakeholders. Um, the latest IPCC report highlighted with very high confidence, um, that's their, their uh, uh, language, that the changes to the biological carbon pump um, will happen with climate change. It, it's certain. But interestingly enough, the magnitude and even the direction of the change, there's very low confidence because there's this web of processes that happen across ocean basins, across different depths, across different trophic levels. And so it, it's really, really important to integrate all this knowledge, and in particular in the twilight zone where there's um, scarce observations. And it's really important as well to constrain the uh, uncertainty um, in terms of biological carbon pump contribution to the carbon cycle as it is as large as all the human uh, annual carbon emissions. So Jetson's still fairly young. It's about a two year, two and a half year old uh, program. It started, um, so our, our engagement is still, um, is still developing, but we have uh, invited and we're still inviting um, throughout the, the, the community of stakeholders, not just scientists, to the steering committee to make sure everyone that has an interest in the Twilight Zone uh, has a seat at the table and has a voice. Uh, we have open monthly calls um, that are open to everyone to sign up. Everyone can contribute, again, not just scientists. Um, everything gets archived on YouTube, so whoever doesn't get the chance to participate, um, especially because we try to get all the time zones to make sure we are reaching out uh, the entire globe, um, people can watch uh, online. And we are creating this repository of amazing knowledge and updated. Um, and just to finalize, um, we are also engaging with the Ocean Decade 
um, ECOP program, so we have an ECOP lead. Um, there's a lot of leadership with uh, young professionals uh, leading a lot of this effort into to, to creating this benchmark for, for the Balash Karam Pump. And that's basically all the time I have. If you have any questions, I'm, I'm, I'm around. Thank you very much, Philippa. So I just want to pick on your last point because many of those programs that you're hearing today, we are not working individually and, and you know in silos. We are working across a whole communities and working amongst themselves. And the way those projects are set up are also calling for uh, you know new new collaborations through the, the different calls, uh, you know, decade action calls uh, that are issued twice a year, so that projects can come and work under those programs uh, and, and 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 create that that community and helping to co-design the, the science. So we're still going to stay with the, the carbon focus, uh, but we're going to go to the blue carbon. And uh, it's my pleasure to give the floor to uh, Professor Bill Austin from the University of St. Andrews to talk about the Global Ocean Decade Program for Blue Carbon. Thank you. Could you go back to the first slide, please? Um, it's a pleasure to be here to represent GoBC today. And I just wanted to pick up on this theme of integrated ocean carbon research. So blue carbon really does sit in an integrated context. Uh, this slide takes us back to Glasgow, where nature and I think the ocean climate nexus really came to the fore at the COP. And that was mentioned already today. And. Um, it's a slide that I'm, I'm very proud of in that we both organized at our National Academy a Blue Carbon Science meeting uh, aligned with COP and also uh, worked with artists uh, here um, from the venue, one of our Blue Carbon ecosystems, uh, coastal wetlands, really to reach um, that public audience. And I think you know the science that we do as knowledge the science is knowledge, of course, uh, needs to reach across this spectrum. And that's a particular uh, challenge for all of us. Next slide, please. So blue carbon in many ways is a nature-based approach and um, it's an attractive approach. It's politically attractive. It's attractive uh, in terms of nature restoration. And it also, I think, uh, helps us articulate the objectives of the decade as a program for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So in many ways, what we're trying to achieve are outcomes for climate, for people, and for nature. Uh, but I'm always reminded at these meetings that uh, we have to remember the laws. And the first law uh, that we all need to remind ourselves of repeatedly, of course, is that these solutions, as attractive as they are at the present day, are not an alternative to decarbonizing our economies, and they must be accompanied by sweet, uh, swift, deep emission cuts. But they offer very many other benefits. Next slide, please. Um, will that go forward one or back one? Or we've lost the, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll end very quickly. Um, the, the hidden image behind those school children is uh, an evidence needs statement from our UK government. And it's an example, one example from around the globe of how policymakers need to understand what blue carbon can offer. And blue carbon offers um, a modest abatement potential. We understand that. And so the challenge for the science here is actually the integrated um, benefits that restoring these ecosystems bring. And I think that's a key message that we shouldn't forget in the ocean decade, particularly in our field of carbon research, where we can overly focus on the greenhouse gas abatements at the cost of all the other benefits and advantages of restoring nature. This is a low cost, low risk opportunity. We should seize this quickly. Uh, so with those children is the minister, um, now cabinet secretary uh, for our Scottish government, understanding, I think, that we can communicate uh, with all audiences uh, the opportunities uh, for the oceans in these coastal habitats. And then, of course, one of the things that we want to do in our program is partnerships uh, for knowledge 
and to build capacity. So we're, we're uh, very pleased recently to have partnered with another uh, UN organization, the International Atomic Energy Agency. We met in Vienna two weeks ago to build and diversify that knowledge partnership. And so this is something uh, that you know we obviously want to build over the, uh, the decades. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Bill. We are going to remain within the carbon discussion. Uh, next uh, speaker is uh, Professor Nianji Jiao from uh, um, the Xiamen University. He's going to talk to us about global ones, uh, ocean negative carbon emissions. And I'm sure he will explain the terminology behind that. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. So, um, I'm very glad to be here to, uh, with the people here to discuss about uh, the uh, negative climate emission. Um, I'm a co chair in the uh, UN Ocean Decade International Program called Global Ocean Negative Climate Emission, or Global Ones, in short. So, I'm going to talk about uh, three points, or I'm going to address three questions. Number one, why? Uh, what is the ones? Number two, why we need to do this? And the third is how to do this. So for the first one, it's about a kind of a concept, wise. When I uh, see wise, you may come up with the uh, name of a movie, right? That's an American movie, <laughs> which is really lovely, it's amazing. But you may also come up with another term about uh, the, um, you know, so once, uh, one time opportunity in a lifetime. Thanks by the ocean decade, right? But what I want to emphasize here, why stand for ocean negative carbon emission? So then, why we need to do why? Because as everybody knows about the climate change is the biggest environmental issue we are facing today. And the major cause for global warming is anthropogenic emission. And negative emission is the opposite word of emission, which means when the flux of the negative carbon emission equals the flux of emission, we're going to reach carbon neutral, right? So that's a good thing. Right? So we need to do negative carbon emission, which is just like a CDR. So many people use to use the term CDR. I think that's a good word. But when you see marine CDR, is, do you mean you're going to remove CO2 from the, you know, the ocean, from the marine environments? So a little bit of kind of a confusing. But I don't, I'm not against to use this term. It's fine. But what I, I'm going to emphasize is the ocean negative carbon emission is the right word for us. So that's the, um, the, about the concept. And then why do we need to do this? You, as I mentioned, so... It's uh, time to take actions because the global warming is there, it's real. And the, um, the ocean is uh, actually the largest carbon reservoir on the Earth. The size of this carbon reservoir is about uh, 20 times that of the land and 50 times that of uh, the uh, atmosphere. However, the ocean already stored 93% of the CO2 on the Earth. So we're going to take some risk if we do further negative carbon emission. So that's a big challenge. We need to do science. We need to do develop some technologies. And then maybe we need to develop that technology into protocols and even international standards. Then people can follow. So that's why we proposed this international program to the UN decade. And then we got uh, approved last year. So that's uh, why we need to do this. And then finally, how do we do this? It's a really hard part. So what are we going to do is to uh, first co-design the scientific research. It's very innovative research. So we, we have to face the challenge. And then we're going to establish some time series stations around the world at to the representative uh, size all over the world. And then we do MRV monitoring. Another mission of the, uh, the program is to uh, 
uh, establish kind of uh, evaluation assessment framework for the, uh, the approaches, the wise approaches. Uh, hopefully, we could do smart approaches. Smart here means the initial of the, the following words, specific, manageable, and the achievable, uh, realistic, and in limited time, smart approaches. <laughs> okay, so um, finally, we're gonna do some uh, very important things for the young generation, and even for the public, and even for policymakers. Dance science education and a capacity building. So these are the four themes or four directions or four missions we're gonna do in the next uh, five years to 10 years. Uh, so that's the, um, the, the missions. I think the uh, Global Wines program is open, open to all of you here and all to the world. So um, we have uh, more than 30 countries joining us uh, so far, but it's still open. I think uh, together we're gonna make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Joe. And I understand you had a big gathering in uh, in, in, in Xiamen not very long ago, and uh, Peter Thompson was there, and we were talking about the the need for for science and the decay to really address uh, this issue of CDR and really build the research behind it. So thank you. Uh, next uh, on my list is Professor Steve Widdicombe uh, with the Plymouth Marine Laboratory, and Steve is going to address the Ocean Acidification Research for Sustainability Program. Okay. Thank you very much, Julian. Um, so. Ours, the ORS program, Ocean Acidification Research for Sustainability, was one of the first, it was in the first tranche of UN Decade programs that was, that was endorsed. Um, so I've been talking about ORS for quite a while now. Um, but interestingly, every time I agree to do one of these events for Julian, he's always one step ahead of me. And he always asks a question that means I have to go back to my presentations and I have to think about a new way of presenting it uh, to address the question. So one, one day I might get ahead of you, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not banking on that. So, for this one, I, we, I went back to the, the UNEP report in 2017 around, um, around how science and policy, what the challenges were of getting science into policy. And they, they identified 10 steps that we really need to, to address. And, and they can be uh, linked together in a number of categories. And I looked at how ORS is kind of meeting those challenges from that report. And I was rather pleased to see how well they aligned. So the first category was about, under, fundamentally, you start with understanding the gaps and, uh, and capacities that exist in the, in the particular challenge that you're trying to address. And, and that's what we did with ORS. We went on. Unlike a group of scientists, how we normally operate, where we think about some really cool science and then build a program around it, we went back to the concept of a theory of change to understand what, what is it we wanted to achieve by the end of the decade. What, what were the benefits? What was the impact we wanted to create? And then go back and understand the science we needed to do to deliver that. Because time is running out, and there's no way we've got enough time to do all the really cool ocean acidification science we would like to do as scientists. And at the heart of that theory of change program, you come out with these, these targeted outcomes. And you structure your work around delivering these, these seven key outcomes that, if we are successful, will mean that we're in a bit better position at the end of the decade in order to, to, to deal with the challenge that ocean acidification is facing us. Associated with each of those outcomes that we identified, we have created a series of white papers, which we will be publishing soon as a IOC um, special, um, uh, a special publication, which will hopefully provide a, a signpost to the community and the type of actions we want to, to go forward. So ours is very much now at the stage where we are entering an implementation phase. So if we can have the next slide, please, please, Alison. So that leads us on to then the category two, which is you, you're not really going to make create any uh, change unless you develop partnerships. Scientists, it's the ocean decade for science, but science is not going to be the, the sole deliverer of change. So key to ours is about deliver, delivering the partnerships outside of the science community that's going to allow us to realize those outcomes. And as I said, each of those outcomes has a, a working group associated with it. And the heart of that working group is, uh, will be the people who are reaching across different disciplines to be able to deliver the kind of actions that we identify in the white papers. And this is a call out to anyone. If you're interested in ocean acidification and making change, there is a working group for you so, so in, in one of those outcomes. So please do reach out to me. 
Category three is then around filling the gaps in the evidence needed. Um, and there's a lot of work. Obviously, it's a science. There's an a large part of the science program. So it's taking um, ocean acidification observations, co-locating of observations with, with, with other uh, marine, uh, co-locating ocean acidification observations with other marine observations, understanding the biological impacts, and creating projections and predictions of how things are going to happen into the future at relevant scales. So there's a huge amount of work that still needs to be done from a scientific perspective. And how we're addressing this is, is through, as Julian said, calls for projects and actions that will be endorsed uh, under, Ocean, under the OARS theme. So we call out uh, for those people working in this field to, to get their, their, their work endorsed. But we're aware that the world is, is bigger and not everybody wants to have an endorsed project or, or action. So we've also launched a voluntary commitment um, scheme within OARS where anyone can go on and, and, and make a commitment to the work they are doing in this field. And the reason why this is so important is it not only, it not only gives visibility to the work you're doing in this field, but it also inspires others to join as well and see what they can do. If you can do it, then maybe so can we. Uh, and and it, it, it grows the community through a sense of shared belonging and, 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 and inspiration throughout that thing. On to the next slide, please. And then finally, if we're thinking about policy, um, about building capacities and also creating the practice which are effective for exchange, this is a key part of where we now then bring the science into, into creating effective change. And it focused very much in on ORS Outcome 7. I'm delighted to say Jessie Turner from the Ocean Acidification Alliance is here, and she's the co-champion of this outcome. And doing huge amount of work in terms of not only uh, embedding uh, evidence, scientific evidence into the policy, but also training policy makers to be able to do that, and also training the scientists to be able to have, have that meaningful exchange. And, and the steps on the left were the, were the ones I drew from the report, which I thought were most relevant to what we were doing in terms of changing cultures, changing the way in which decision makers make uh, decisions based on evidence, uh, designing the process so it's participatory, move away from this concept of dissemination and outreach and more about co-exchange and co-learning together, and also create accessible and trusted outputs. So if you're at that policy science interface, please do reach out to us. We're looking for people to join the working groups. Talk to Jesse. But the final thing I would like to say is that our outcome six is about public awareness. And we often talk about public awareness. Oh, I've got to tell the public about this issue so they know more. But why do we want them to know more? Um, the key thing is not necessarily to generate public demand on policymakers to act, because I don't really think that's effective. Policymakers know what they need to do, and they want to do the right thing. So in essence, if we can give the the public enough knowledge so that when the policymakers do act, they don't push back, but they understand why policymakers make those, those difficult decisions. And we make it easier for policymakers to embed the kind of policy. Because let's face it, climate policy doesn't come without some pain. So we need to use our knowledge to support policymakers in doing, in doing those painful things. OK? Uh, and I think I'm going to run out of time now, so I'll, I'll, yes. I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Steve. And thank you for, for remembering the original question. <laughs> All right, we have two more to go, uh, but, but also very important issues to come, uh, including inclusivity and, and gender mainstreaming in the work of the Ocean Decade. And my pleasure to give the floor to uh, Jen San from the World Maritime University, Sazakawa Global Ocean Institute, to talk about empowering women in ocean science. Over to you. Thank you, moderator. And um, thank you for the opportunity to showcase our work on this topic. And um, I think what I will do today is give you a little bit of background of where we are sort of globally and um, particularly on the ocean science, and also share a bit of what we've been working on this topic. And um, so I think if we go left, right, and then middle, it, it's kind of um, not a very pretty picture where we are. So the 2023 special report on SDG progress is, is kind of confirmation of we're definitely not on track to achieve gender equality by 2030. And um, there, there are different indicators of how to measure progress, and I think it's only 15%-ish that we are on track. So we have a lot of work to do. And uh, on the ocean science 
specifically, if we're looking at the leaking pipeline, I think this is from the 2015 Global Ocean Science Report. The one thing I want to add to that is this is not probably the most accurate picture because we don't have data. The report was based on 40 plus states report. Many of them don't actually contribute to the survey. So we don't have an accurate picture of where we are, who is doing the science. And uh, so the human element is going to be a key to sort of help us to deliver the science that we want. And this is sort of if we're only employing half of the population, we're probably lacking a major capacity there. If we move on to the right side top, is there's different studies uh, showing the connection between gender and the ocean. I think climate actions is probably one of the better fields that in terms of addressing the visibility acknowledgement of women's contribution. We actually have a gender day with today uh, for this with uh, ILO on a different venue. But what I want to highlight here is we see women everywhere, but somehow we don't see them on the leadership panel. The right bottom photo was from last year's opening. I think this year probably won't look that much different. So the 2023 report highlighted we need 140 years to reach on just by number that on the, quality, on the equality on leadership. And this is not looking at the substantial contribution. We're just saying by number. There are many elements that contributing to this phenomenon, that lack of women's representation uh, and uh, participation on the high level. So if we bring into the decade, I think IOC has for a long time campaigning or advocating to say that we need to notice this, that there is an underrepresentation of women scientists, particularly on the highly technical categories. Um, linked with the leaking pipeline that we do have the capacity because during the last 20, 30 years, we have a large number of female graduates entering the working field. But between 25 to 35, this is where we start to see the workforce start dropping. Because if we look at people's normal life plan, 25 to 30 is in collaboration with their, their family counting. And also for our promotion process, why we don't see enough top layer scientists or policy makers is that we still have this bean counting mechanism to adjust people's progress and their achievement. You don't get hired if you don't have enough output. But if you have like a few years gap in your lifespan, you won't be able to produce as much if just the generalized speaking as your male colleague if who doesn't have enough or the same level of family commitment. So I think in the decades, in the implementation uh, plan, it has been firmly confirmed that they want to remove different barriers for gender. And um, so our program is responding to the call. We started a small program. We're still relatively small compared to what we want to do. If I may move to the next slide, please. So we are at the World Maritime University. We have been working on the maritime side of things. We have a, a big conference every five years to look at women's participation in maritime field. The science, looking at the marine science, is actually a contribution from DFO. Um, thank you. So we started to look at particularly and within the ocean decade contact, who's contributing to the science. And the right side uh, graphic is we came up among the team to look at what steps that we need to take to be able to deliver the science we need for the ocean we want it. Um, there are, we have different level of actions within the program. So the program is capacity development to begin with. We have two postdoc, uh, sorry, two PhD and one postdoc working on the topic that they identify that interest them. One case study in Kenya is national institution study. Uh, one with ISIS, International Exploration, the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea, and we have the postdoc working on the international progress with different uh, UN organizations. Um, what I want to share here today is perhaps some of the um, progress that we contributed. I won't claim credit for everything. Uh, we are only a small part that working towards the same goal with many people. Um, is by action research, the team has been actively participating in different international progress. So our PhD candidate, Ellen Johansson, is embedded with ISIS. She's the one that helped this organization for their over 110, 20 years 
lifespan. They didn't have any gender disaggregated data. So by uh, Ellen's work with her colleague and with support that they have adopted the first gender action plan in 2022. And uh, our postdoc researchers with our team has strongly campaigned for the inclusiveness, uh, inclusive of gender sensitive languages in the BBNG agreement. So instead of saying common heritage of mankind, we finally managed to change the world to humankind. And in establishing different committees, bodies, there is a gender equality uh, approach adopted in that provision. So when we see the scientific bodies that are going to be established under the BBNG agreement, there will be one element considering the equality um, element. The last one I want to highlight is we are taking this uh, alongside with stock taking for reporting the progress the state has been contributing to the marine environment. It is driven by Dualos. Every uh, five years, we have this water ocean assessment. So Marie Mali, working as one of the 25 uh, group of experts, has strongly campaigned for inclusiveness of the gender chapter. So for the first time ever, we're going to see states reporting on their progress on the gender performance in that. Uh, my last comment is perhaps observation of working on this topic. I'm a lawyer myself by training. Um, so this has been a new kind of adventure for me. The two comments that I sometimes get is first from the scientist community is that we're talking about science. We're not talking about gender. You know, this is irrelevant to our work. And I have also received um, some reflections from female scientists is that this topic somehow gives people the impression that female scientists got a job because of the gender element. It's not because of their competence. So I think there are some misunderstanding of what this gender equality is about. And uh, so I think we have enough space. We have enough work to be shared. We are different, but we are one. We are one nation. We are one uh, world. We are one people, one ocean. So I think collectively, we can contribute to that. It's not a fight against men or other genders. It's a call for us all to have the equal opportunity to contribute to what we believe. So I think I'll stop here. And uh, we have some publications available if you want to uh, know more about the work. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Indeed, very, very important. And we, we are certainly tracking that uh, in the ocean decay. This is one of the indicator we, we have. And actually, the figures are pretty good. Uh, I think we have a, a gender part women participation over 50%. Of, I think it's around 55% in all ocean decay actions within the, the whole ecosystem. But anyway, we need more data and, and more, more push, indeed, at the institutional level. Now, uh, my last speaker, and thank you, Alexis, for standing up for almost an hour there on the corner um, to talk about uh, innovation. So Alexis uh, Grosskopf is with the Ocean Hub Africa. He's going to talk about the 1,000 Ocean Startup. Thanks, Jim. I'll try to keep it short and sweet. I'm the startup guy, you can see. I don't, I don't tuck my shirt uh, in my pants. The, uh, why are we doing what we're doing at 1000 Ocean Startups? We've seen, you know, as, as knowledge, we get more and more knowledge, better knowledge, we've heard it. Um, and we also see the conditions in which we evolve changing. We realize that the pressure on the system that we've been evolving or using to evolve as a species, humankind, uh, is wrong. It's not doing the right things. Um, and as much as the IPCC report, you can see plotted on the bottom of this, of this graph showing the atmospheric CO2 increase over time, concentration in the atmosphere, as much as we've had 27, now 28 COPs discussing, acknowledging uh, the fact that we need to change the things that we're doing because we're doing it in the wrong way, the private sector has been very slow to come to the party. Policy and knowledge, science, is specifically science, help to inform decision-making. They affect change, but they do not effect change. It boils down very much to business or businesses to actually start implementing change. And the 10, 10, ten challenges of the decade, um, the ocean decade, provides an excellent framework, framework for translating all these understanding, both in terms of policy, policy framework, knowledge through science and education into action. We believe that entrepreneurship led by science and technology in particular um, will help us achieve the SDGs at the right time and the right pace. 
Um, we need to change businesses, and changing businesses in that it's got a different term. At a, at a, sorry, changing businesses at a high pace and a high scale, it's got a name. We call it startups. Um, so we've come together with all the incubators, accelerators, VC funds, so early stage investment vehicles, um, to catalyze, inspire entrepreneurs, catalyze the change that those startups could achieve um, if we pro provide them with the, the right type of support. We started in 2019 uh, with, I think it was uh, just, just under 20 startups. There's more than 350 now. Uh, there was less than $200 million, uh, which is still very small. Uh, that grew to $1.5 billion of assets under management, with now 37 members have joined the coalition. What we have done coming together is trying to shift that system, move away from that wrong system that has been uh, the system that we evolve in, the system that pours fertilizer and whatever derives economic value. But we're trying to change it, changing it from within, shifting it from within rather than fighting from outside. So we're trying to grow businesses, social enterprises, um, that derive economic value, because that's what the system will grow for us. But we tie to that economic value, um, social benefits and environmental impact. Um, and we invest in those. We've created a standardization framework called the Ocean Impact Navigator based on science to help us inform the decisions in investing and doing the reporting. Um, it's open source on the website of 1,000 Ocean Startups. Um, we've created playbooks and best practices and supported the development of three incubators, ocean impact incubators in the global south using the experience of the members. And we're now working on new types of financing to make sure that we don't perverse incentivize, we don't reproduce the same problems that we've been creating with the wrong systems of financing that promote exponential growth, which by definition is the opposite of reasonable growth, which is a necessary, necessary type of growth that we need to have moving forward. And that's it for me. Great, Thank wonderful. You. Thank you, Alexis. So, big round of applause to our, our action leaders here. Uh, we're going to have a 10 minutes break, uh, so you'll have a chance to, to speak to them and, and ask, uh, you know, how, how can I collaborate? But please come back. Uh, the next part of the event is really to talk about partnership. So, partnership with private sector. How do we make these actions actually? Do we, how do we fund them? How do we connect to policies, to, to the corporate world? We'll have uh, the voice of, uh, of, uh, of um, you know, the, the, the industry. We'll talk about the role of philanthropy. And we'll start looking at what are the, the milestones coming up uh, with the, the, the Barcelona conference uh, next year and, of course, the UNOC uh, 2025. So be back in 10 minutes. Uh, see you soon.
Okay, if you want to take your seats, I think we're going to get things underway with the, uh, with the next panel. So please come in and take your seats. Please, come and sit down. Oh. Do you want to come and sit directly? Yeah, come and, come and sit directly. Okay, let's let's get underway. And after that very uh, rich discussion and examples of uh, showcasing of decade actions, what we want to focus on with this next panel is really looking at some of the partnerships and some of the the actors and the players that need to come together to be able to cre create the enabling environment for the decade to be successful and for the actions to be successful. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alison Clawson. I work at IOC UNESCO in the Ocean Decade team. And I am joined today by a very illustrious panel with some very dear partners who have all been strong supporters of the, of the decade. Um, over many months and years now. And we're going to go through a, a, a moderated discussion to really draw out some of the motivations of these partners to be part of the decade and to inspire others to, to join this, uh, this discussion. So if we, uh, I will introduce everybody um, to, to get started. So starting from the, from the far end, we have Sinead Walsh, who is the Climate Director from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in Ireland. Then we have uh, Mark Heine, who is the CEO of Fugro. Uh, Ashok Adesiem, the Global Public Affairs Director for the 2025 UN Ocean Conference. And finally, Alexandra Dempsey, who is the CEO of the Living Oceans Foundation. So we have a nice mix of industry, philanthropy, and government uh, representation with us. So we're going to get started with, uh, with you, Mark, as the, uh, as the industry representative. Now, FUGRO has been a major supporter of the ocean decade, particularly in relation to ocean data on many different fronts. So could you perhaps start by explaining the role that FUGRO has played and, and really the importance of unlocking ocean data uh, for climate action within the framework of the, of the decade. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Alison. It's great to, uh, to be here. Um, so, uh, very interesting presentations also before here uh, in the previous panel. So, uh, thanks very much uh, from everyone. Um, yeah, so Fugo is, is um, a uh, geodata specialist. So we, we collect um, and, and work with, with data, and especially for decades already with ocean data. And we do that for, um, yeah, for the industry, and that is multiple industries, multiple markets. And we have been involved in uh, many initiatives uh, very early on al already in uh, JEPCO and uh, also CBET 2030. And, uh, and uh, been been a founding partner there as well, and therefore we got got early involved in the ocean decade discussions uh, uh, there, and uh, became a, a partner with the IOC, and also the ocean decade, and later on also a member of the alliance uh, group there. So uh, that was very important for us because it's very close to our heart. Um, we we believe in uh, in the ultimate purpose to create that safe and livable world, and we believe that it cannot be done without the oceans. Um, there are also some great statements here in the pavilion on uh, on the wall, uh, where where I think it makes it very clear how important the ocean uh, data is, and it's uh, specifically a, a privilege for me to also um, a, a co-chair a, a committee there um, uh, for um, together with uh, Vladimir, uh, who was on stage uh, earlier this morning, uh, uh, and um, we're looking at. Um, unlocking the um, the potential of the data that is stored in the private sector. And as Fugro works with many different markets in very different markets, uh, ranging from the energy companies, but also um, uh, the companies that, that, that put the fiber optic cables on the on the seafloor, but we also have in that committee uh, people that work in the fisheries, uh, to see if we can uh, use the data that is already out there and, uh, and help them to... Uh, uh, yeah, to create uh, platforms to uh, to actually uh, donate that to the scientific world. And uh, because Fugro has many contacts there, uh, we feel that we can play a major role there. And uh, th this is uh, maybe first uh, good to mention that, uh, but it's an important committee that really is uh, 
uh, kicked off now and has already 10, uh, 10 members. Um, and we're trying to extend that uh, with uh, with a few more um, uh, key um, industry players to uh, to really make uh, make big steps uh, towards uh, yeah defining best practices to uh, to uh, donate data to the scientific world. Fantastic, thank you. And yes, having been in a number of those meetings, I think it's been really interesting to see not only the diversity of the of the members in that corporate group, but also the enthusiasm uh, to really be able to engage in the decade. And there have been some interesting case studies and use studies that are being developed to really demonstrate some of those benefits and 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 impacts. And I hope we'll be able to publish those soon and and entice other members into that that group as well. So coming to you now, Alex, um, the Living Oceans Foundation is part of the Ocean Decade Foundations Dialogue, which is an informal group of philanthropic funding agencies that are supporting the Ocean Decade in very diverse ways, either directly through in-kind resources, through support, through advocacy. And this group met in Monaco earlier this year in June. It feels like it was a lot longer ago than that, but it was only June. So can you talk a little bit about the, or the your role in the Foundations Dialogue, but also about the key outcomes and achievements of the, uh, of the meeting that was in? Uh, held in Monaco. Uh, good, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much, Allison. Um, yes, so I'm Alex Dempsey. I'm the CEO of the Khalid bin Sultan Living Oceans Foundation. Uh, we are a private operating foundation that is based um, in the United States, but we um, really work internationally uh, to conserve coral reefs and, and other um, associated nearshore ecosystems, such as seagrasses and mangroves. Um, and we do this um, by harnessing something that is, is really important to the decade, is, is using co-design. So we have um, three very strong departments in both science, education, and communication. And uh, we really use both, all three of those departments to really try to move the needle for, for ocean conservation. Um, Specifically, um, our work within the decade and, and, and more importantly with the foundation's dialogue really came about um, when we applied for a, a UN Ocean Decade program, oh, sorry, project, big difference between a project and a program, uh, project, um, you know, really a uh, citizen science-based project um, looking at monitoring nearshore coral reef ecosystems um, through a, a grassroots approach with and something that's really important that came out of the Monaco statement um, with the foundation's dialogue was really, um, you know, the importance of, of bringing together uh, the Founders Collaborative, um, which looked at uh, philanthropic institutions um, coming together and really putting pen to paper on how to galvanize funding opportunities, alignment of resources, et cetera, to, to, to help um, fund the programs, fund the projects that the, that the decade is so focused on. And really, um, but even a, a, a larger overarching goal is the Foundation's Dialogue is able to bring together, you know, philanthropic institutions that are so nimbly placed to be able to move between the private sector, uh, between governments, between local NGOs, and that fluidity that phil you know philanthropy is able to contribute, as well as galvanizing um, funding resources, et cetera, um, is, is something that um, the, found the Foundation's Dialogue Monaco Statement really um, really was able to, 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 dig, to tease out Thank you. And, and for those of you who are interested in learning more about the philanthropic engagement in the in the decade, there'll be another event this afternoon in the Science to Climate Action Pavilion, which is hosted by the Mary Foundation, where Alex will be there as well, where we're going to start looking at some of the best practices uh, for philanthropic investment in ocean science through the ocean decade, which was also another one of the priorities that really came out from that from that Monaco statement. So I think it is at one 15, if I remember correctly. Yes, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> so join us there. Okay, so now coming to you, Sinead. Um, so Climate Director from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ireland. And, and Ireland is, a, I guess, a newer partner of the Ocean Decade, having recently created the National Decade Committee. And of course, we're now collaborating through the Our Shared Ocean Programme. Um, of Ireland with a specific focus to small island developing states, which we're very excited about. So could you talk a little bit more about the support to small island developing states and notably the, the new initiative that we're, we're collaborating on around uh, co-design and, and training within the Ocean Decade? Yes, I will, I will try and do that. Uh, good morning, um, everybody. Um, I suppose maybe a little bit of context, uh, which is that I suppose as probably in many countries, the, the climate agenda has been sort of skyrocketing in, in Ireland and, and, and happily and also in terms of our, 
our international support. So we're, we're, we're in the process of, of more than doubling our climate finance in, in, in three and a half years, which is uh, harder than it uh, probably sounds. Um, and a really key priority within that is, is the ocean's uh, agenda. And, and obviously, as an island, we, uh, we, we, we uh, I suppose, understand uh, maybe and, and identify a lot with uh, with SIDS uh, and with the kind of challenges that, that they face, uh, given, given our own kind of... Uh, our own economics and, 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 and history and, and all of that. Um, so we have, as you say, um, uh, Alison, uh, really focused in on, on how we can support it. So we, we, we do this in, in, in kind of um, various ways. Uh, but I think in terms of the, the Our Shared Ocean Initiative, if, if people aren't uh, familiar with it, it's, uh, it's implemented by the Marine Institute. I don't know. I think there's somebody here from the Marine Institute. But... How's it going? So, so, so you can you can get vastly more uh, um, uh, knowledge and information uh, uh, from uh, from the Marine Institute later on. But essentially, it's 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 uh, it's it's a research and innovation um, partnership. Uh, we're, we're trying to, to connect up Irish and uh, and SIDS, um, you know, researchers support uh, research projects of of, of SIDS um, and and build capacity both of ourselves, uh, of, of our own uh, community in Ireland, as well as the communities uh, in, in the SIDS. So we, we're up and running in, um, in a number of places already, in Guam and Palau, in, in Trinidad and, and Tobago and, and Haiti. Uh, but it's, 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 it's only, you know, it only kicked off in, in, in 2022. Um, so so it'll, it'll certainly be, uh, be expanding. Um, and I suppose we, yeah, we really hope that it, 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 it can play a role in, in this much broader, uh, in this much broader agenda. I mean, maybe just to say as well, we, we do, um, we, we, we have a, um, this is actually sort of an unusual thing, but we, we, we had a, a special SID strategy, uh, we, which we made in, in, in 2019. Um, and this, I don't think ever really happens, but we, we actually achieved all the objectives early, so we actually had to come up quite suddenly this past year with a second SID strategy. So we're actually launching that here at, at COP. If, if anybody's interested, we'll have a SID strategy launch event on the 8th at uh, 2 o'clock. Yeah. Uh, um, and... Um, um, I, I suppose one of the things uh, to note about that is that has kind of four elements of it, and one one element of it is is the support to SIDS on oceans. So, so the Our Shared Ocean Initiative is, is is a huge. It's like it's you know it's 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 a big project for us. It's 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 three point eight or maybe I should say program. I'm not really sure. Uh, three point eight million uh, uh, euros uh, over over five years. But I suppose it's it's one of a number of of activities that we do, including things like supporting um, Blue Action Fund, which I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with, and, and Pro Blue and, and various other things. So, so as you say, we're a sort of a, a, a newer kid on the block, uh, quite involved in the BBNJ negotiations, also looking at, at whether how, how we can support LDCs and SIDS within that rollout now as well. So, so I think we're, we're, we're keen to, um, you know, I suppose, to take advantage of, of the knowledge and expertise in, in rooms like this. And, and those of you who've been focusing, and, and, and France, of course, a, a, a great uh, a leader in this and, and, and other countries. Um, so yeah, so we're keen, we're keen to do more uh, in this area. I think it, it fits very well for us as, uh, as islanders. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, and thank you very much again for the for the support to the decade. We have indeed been working very closely with the with the Marine Institute, and and part of that support is going to specifically be supporting new groups of partners who want to co-design decade actions um, coming from the Caribbean SIDS, because we found that this has been one of the barriers to leadership by Caribbean SIDS within the decade has been this this lack of skills, time, resources to really be able to co-design decade actions, and so we were working very closely with your with your team in the Marine Institute to, to roll out some very uh, tailored support and mentoring to those groups, which will start early next year. And hopefully we'll get a, a wonderful new portfolio of programs and projects coming into the, to the decade as a result of that. So. So over to you, Ashok. Um, so we've, you know, these, there's been a lot of talk already over just over the last two or three days about some of these big global convenings that are coming up, the Barcelona Conference, Costa Rica, then of course, the, the cherry on the cake, the, the United Nations Ocean Conference in Nice and its special events. And I was wondering just to, if you could just talk a little bit about how you're conceptualizing some of these links between the work that's happening in the ocean decade and how some of this, these links are going to happen in the lead up to UNOC. 
stock in Nice in 2025. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Alison. So I'm Ashok. I work actually for the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but indeed since France is co-host with Costa Rica of the UN Ocean Conference, which is the universal conference uh, happening in Nice in June 2025. Um, actually, it's not the cherry. I think it's the cake. <laughs> uh, and what we're trying to do with you, uh, IOC, and I salute uh, Vladimir Yabinin, the executive secretary of IOC, and we meet almost every week, uh, is trying to align the planets towards and the whole planet, actually, and the people, uh, towards this uh, universal rendezvous in, uh, in Nice. What we have collectively decided, France, Costa Rica, and the UN, uh, UN DESA, UN agencies, is to put science at the heart of the conference. So uh, not as a side event, you're right, uh, and not only as a special event, but also in the main, in the main conference. So uh, let me just give you a few... Uh, uh, informations of the architecture, uh, where all of you, all of us, are invited to to gather, to join, and to participate in the making of the cake, and maybe also of the cherry. Uh, the cherry would be most probably, we hope, uh, the deliverables and the the outcomes of uh, of this conference, which should not be just another conference, just another U UNOC three, but we hope to do in Nice what Paris did. Sorry, we're French and a little bit French. Uh, but we hope to, to do what, what Paris did for climate in, in, in Nice, and that can work only with all of you, and that could work only with science at the heart. So, uh, UNOC special event will start on science. One Ocean Science Congress will start on the 4th uh, of June 2024. 25, sorry, 2025 at 9 o'clock. And it lost. <laughs> And it will last three days, 4th, 5th, and 6th of June in Nice, uh, in the site where you'll have the conference a few days later. Uh, it's co-chaired by uh, CNRS, CNRS Jean-Pierre Gattuso, who's speaking with Peter Thompson there, uh, and uh, François Houllier, who is the president of IFREMER, who's uh, somewhere gone, and uh, IOC in the, at par in the organizing committee. And there's a list of uh, uh, scientists who are part of the uh, scientific uh, committee. And I'm uh, happy to be part of also the, the organizing uh, committee. Three days, there are six items. There are six, uh, uh, six different uh, layers. Um, they are going to organize uh, in the forms of plenaries, workshops, uh, and come out with policy recommendations, policy briefs for the leaders when they'll arrive on Sunday the 8th of June to celebrate the World Ocean Day. And especially, uh, we'll bring them a lot of pressure through this uh, UN uh, UNOC special event with, with science on these six items uh, on all the topics which are uh, joining us in this uh, Ocean Pavilion, and we have already discussed many about them. In parallel, we're going to organize uh, with Romain Troublé and the platform uh, Océan et Climat in, uh, in Nice, uh, Sommet Mondial des Villes et des Régions Côtières, a coalition of uh, cities of uh, coastal regions and of uh, insular states uh, who would gather based on the work which has done, been done by cities. I think you, you listened to the presentation just before on the recommendations that this platform, which has joined, which has coalesced a lot of number of cities, but also of scientists, and they've come up with great recommendations with science, again, at the heart of the system, but also finance. Uh, so they're going to address not only through a manifesto, but address uh, the issue of financing uh, adaptation and mitigation, uh, reinsuring cities with uh, insurances like ORA is going to be part of the, this, this coalition. And again, science at the heart of uh, decision making. Uh, and the third uh, UNOC uh, special event, still as a prologue of the conference, will take place in Monaco and uh, will bring the world of ocean finance and blue economy together. It's co-chaired by Pascal Lamy, former director general of WTO, and uh, Ilana Said, Ambassador Ilana Said, who is a uh, representative of uh, Palau in, uh, at the UN. And so there are three work streams, again with scientists on board, uh, working on uh, 
scaling up blue economy projects, it's project oriented, scaling up uh, ocean finance solutions, not talking just like that about a new fund, because it's very easy to say you need a new fund. The thing is to do what exactly and with whom and how sustainable that could be and not a whatever. So um, again, we want to be informed by scientists in this making of the cake. Uh, so in every layer of these special events and including at the uh, conference itself, in parallel of the plenaries, we're going to organize, for those who were in Lisbon, they were interactive dialogues, which we thought were not interactive and were not really dialogues. Uh, we have changed slightly the name. It's called Ocean Action Panels. So we're going to have 10 ocean action panels on 10 different topics. And we have to negotiate with uh, all the different countries of the topics. And we have a meeting in uh, summer 24 uh, to finalize the 10 topics. But we have proposed with Costa Rica that in each of the 10 ocean action panels, you have a scientist uh, for the 10 topics from decarbonization to plastic to high seas and all that is on the table. We want to converge uh, towards execution of what is uh, on the table and bring new items like, like sea level rise, but with scientists in each of the ocean action panels. En route to Nice, there's Barcelona. And thank you for having us on board in the organizing committee and the discussions that you're having with the world. Uh, en route, we have uh, this ocean decades midterm uh, uh, meeting, which is very important in April uh, 24, and we hope to make Barcelona a success and from Barcelona to take the outcomes of Barcelona, uh, with your permission, to, uh, to the UNOC, the special events, and the main, main, main conference as well. Fantastic, thank you. And yes, very, very uh, appreciative of the support and the collaboration to ensure that what is discussed in Barcelona is able to be brought to the to the table in UNOC. And and what will be discussed in Barcelona, and we'll hear more about this afterwards, but is is sort of looking at where we're at in the decade, where, where what have some of the achievements been and what are some of the priorities moving forward, and particularly looking at this in terms of both the Ocean Decade challenges, but also starting to look at it from a regional perspective, because I think a lot of the work and a lot of the impact that is happening in the decade is happening at the national and the regional level. And that's where I'd like to, well, first of all, come back to you, I think, Sinead, and, 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 and try and tie some of these things together about some of the science and some of the, the ways we can look at this at either different regional or geographic perspectives. And thinking perhaps as you've been developing your SIDS strategy, what are some of the key knowledge gaps or some of the key science gaps that you've been thinking about in terms of the SIDS strategy where Ireland will be providing support? Geez, I, I think to a room like this, I probably can't really answer that question, you know, because uh, like we're, we're uh, maybe my I mean, Marine Institute colleague would like to, to chip in on this, but I mean, we're, the SID strategy, I suppose, is quite a broad framework, right? So we have, you know, it's very much a focus on let's put, um, you know, the, the, the various uh, SIDS regions, you know, let's give them the, the leadership in defining what it is they, they want to, to focus on within these different areas, oceans, as I say, um, being one of them. But in terms of how far that uh, conversation has gone, uh, I don't know if my colleague would like to, to chip in, but would you, would you, David, is it? Please come down, David, and yeah. Some of the some of the key knowledge gaps, some of the key science and knowledge gaps in SIDS regions that you're looking to support. Thank you. 
Fantastic. Maybe, maybe I, I can just chip in a little bit uh, more to that, just just also in terms of our broader our broader oceans agenda. I mean, like I, I can tell you what we sort of end up focusing on, which is because you know, as David said, and we take the same approach to our broader work, is that we don't we don't we don't like as Ireland to come in and 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 tell people what they need. So so we we, we tend to be uh, sort of SIDS led in, in in this case, or LDC is another big big focus of ours. But what we end up f you know supporting a lot is is MPAs and and, and various kind of. Uh, you know initiatives on on protection and also you know this point about about coastal communities and and resilience. I mean it it, it might be sort of interesting to note that, and and and, and I've yet to find somebody who can beat this statistic. Um, in our climate finance, ninety six percent is adaptation. Um, now, you know about half of that has mitigation co benefits, and we're happy about that. We're not against mitigation on the contrary, but but I think it is it is an extremely heavy adaptation portfolio, which I think is is a bit different to to a lot of other people, and so that obviously comes through uh, in in the oceans work as well, and then the. The third component uh, that we, we end up doing a lot on is is sort of ocean governance, which does also link to the kind of international work on on, on BB and J and so on. But but as David said, we 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 try to be very kind of led by by the partners um, that we have. So the the SID strategy itself, you know, it, you know, much as it's it, it's much broader, uh, um, you know, than what we're doing within this uh, this particular program. But it also was a, a process of sort of going around. So just just maybe a couple of points that um, I just I just thought w were interesting about this about this project. That you know, just because this is a very learned group, y you might be interested to know. We, we've actually had some delays actually in in getting this program up and running, and we've had to make some adjustments. And one of the adjustments is that. Typically, for these kind of research partnerships, we we ask, say, uh, you know, a team of SIDS to have a, an Irish researcher. This is what we do in, in lots of other research partnerships. That actually, we, we've had to waive that now because it just doesn't really didn't really work for the SIDS. Um, so now we, we just don't have that that requirement at all. And I think you know a lot of this is to do with time differences. And I I, I focus a huge amount on on loss and damage. I've been working a lot with SIDS over, over the last year on the transitional committee. And you know the time differences and and the sheer the sheer distances has been huge. Um, and then the other point is that we we would we would normally have a sort of an ODA requirement for our our SIDS work. And we've also we've also waived that. And I, and I think that's part of this. Much much bigger climate finance conversation where we recognise that you know ODA uh, concepts are, are are a bit outdated now when it comes to climate vulnerability. So um, yeah, thanks. Fantastic, thank you. And yeah, I think uh, there's been some really interesting discussions. Um, well, yesterday, and I think are going to continue over the next few days, and then of course leading up to Nice again around these questions around finance and the, the the financing of ocean climate solutions, and 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 how we can move past this project-based approach to a to a more flexible and integrated approach. So, I think there are lots, many more discussions to be to be having on that, and great to see that example coming from Ireland. So, Alex, I'll come back to you now and, and also coming back to this, this science question. And we had a session yesterday um, at the Jamal Arts Centre where we started thinking about the ocean decade in this region, in the Arab region, the Red Sea region and so on. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit, you've worked a lot in this area, including through the, the global expedition, but talk a little bit about some of the gaps perhaps that we're seeing in, in this, this area or some of the challenges to getting really coordinated ocean climate science and knowledge generation and uptake in this region. Great, thank you. Yes, so um, the, the Khalid bin Sultan Living Oceans Foundation um, as benefactor is His Royal Highness uh, Prince Khalid bin Sultan, who's um, from Saudi Arabia. And um, I'm sure as, you know, f from a lot of information coming from different pavilions and whatnot, uh, from COP you've probably learned that the Red Sea coastline in Saudi Arabia is being developed quickly um, for both, uh, mainly for a, a tourism um, uh, perspective, um, but there, the government and ministries and 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 other um, scientific institutions are trying to do that um, as sustainably as as possible, and really, um, you know, particularly looking at at coral reefs and near shore ecosystems, um, you know, something that the the foundation is able to to do, kind of what I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, is be able to to um, move between. Um, meetings with ministries move between um, the private sector, um, the tourism sector, um, and then of course local NGOs, et cetera, um, to be able to act as a convening body to have all of these different players um, kind of meet together to have a meeting of the minds on how to 
um, you know, tackle this massive development and, and do it sustainably um, to help um, you know, protect coral reefs, as well as other, other sustainable development goals that the UN has, has put out. And I think we're gonna be um, seeing a lot of advancements in, in coral reef restoration, um, a lot of advancements on eDNA and other, um, um, and other new technology and new methods for, for coral reef monitoring and for more uh, sustainable development um, in, the Arab, in the Arab region. Thank you. Fantastic. And, and just recently, our Decade Advisory Board actually met um, and, and looked at some new potential contributions from Saudi Arabia in, in terms of coral reef restoration. So I think there may be some new players coming into the Decade ecosystem on this as well. So coming back and, and, and coming to the close to the end of the panel, but uh, coming back to this idea of partnerships as well, where we, where we sort of started off. And, and Mark, I'd like to come back to you on this, because you really, Fugro, you know, has has really been instrumental in engaging other industry partners in the Decade, whether, whether it be through the corporate data group. You were the, I think, the first private sector partner in the Ocean Decade Alliance as well. So perhaps to, to if you can talk about some of the, the key arguments or the key points, the business case for industry engagement in the decade that you that you use when you're talking to other industry partners. Yeah, uh, very very good question. So I think uh, we have spoken a lot about um, why ocean data is important uh, for, for the climate action, and I think there's a lot of data required. And I uh, will say a little bit more about the complexity around that, but uh, maybe first uh, around the, uh, the partnerships and, uh, and what we're trying to do there. Uh, yeah, Fugro is uh, maybe a little bit of a, a special company in that sense that we're um, uh, partly on the scientific side and do a lot of research and investigation. And then obviously also uh, very active in uh, on the on the private side uh, with with multiple uh, markets, as I mentioned before. So uh, we we felt that uh, we can play uh, a linking pin there to to actually um, also convince industry partners uh, to uh, to um, to chip in their uh, knowledge and also data that is available and very often stored stored in archives and not being utilized uh, very efficiently. A uh, great example, we spoke about the gaps in, uh, in the scientific world. Well, one very simple example is uh, bathymetry data. So uh, just uh, mapping the oceans, uh, there's only 25% mapped uh, roughly uh, globally. Uh, and there's still a lot of uh, work to be done to have a more accurate seabed uh, uh, map of, of, of this, uh, this world. Um, and there's a lot of data stored with, um, with companies that actually are active uh, uh, on the ocean. Uh, developing uh, energy solutions or installing cables, fiber optic cables, or or uh, maybe uh, uh, installing windmills right now. Uh, so there, there's a lot of activity. Uh, there's also a lot of use of the ocean. Uh, I, I personally believe that everybody that makes use of the ocean should also uh, participate in uh, in doing a good to the ocean as well. And uh, and they may, might, might need to actually get a tax uh, related to that, but that's just an idea. I think uh, you need to chip in uh, your your efforts there. And there's a lot of willingness in the industry, I would say. They very often don't know how to do it. So, and that's where we, we're helping. In these committees, we're trying to get very simple ways of, of how to donate data. And if I give that a simple example, and we'll show that also in the Barcelona conference, uh, some tangible examples and progress that we have made on the bathymetry data, for instance, uh, where um, energy companies, uh, fishery uh, um, uh, companies, uh, all, all sorts of uh, industries are helping to donate data to the scientific community. And that can be done uh, by also um, uh, mobilizing the uh, industry associations. So we're at the moment in the process of uh, um, yeah, basically uh, yeah, also getting these industry associations to, uh, to sign up on, uh, okay, we commit to, uh, to support this uh, initiative on certain data sets and then uh, see if we can uh, then uh, get that all together in, in a very fast uh, manner because the data is already there. And it could also be uh, current information, uh, salinity uh, profiles, all, all sorts of information that is already there for many working areas. Uh, it's my personal belief that um, it can only work if uh, we have lots of action uh, around the oceans uh, in place. Uh, there's a lot happening there, but uh, we need to combine all these things. So it's nice if we plan all these initiatives, uh, then we get uh, action by planning. Uh, we can uh, we have a lot of community or a great community here uh, thinking about the ocean. So that's action by habit, I would say. But uh, we also need to, to work together uh, between the political environment, the scientific world, and the industry. And then we get um, action by power, I would say, uh, by working together and understanding what is uh, what is really required. 
And then lastly, uh, a uh, small example, uh, data is not straightforward. Uh, we just recently got involved in a project uh, in Italy, um, uh, which is a great example where we get involved in uh, seagrass mapping for uh, the Italian government uh, around the coastlines there in the Mediterranean Sea. Very important project. There we had to actually get our marine expertise and land expertise together, probably 10 different uh, technologies that come together with a few partnerships uh, also to really get the right data set. So it's not straightforward if you get to the more complex uh, uh, problems in the world. Fantastic, thank you. And we had a really interesting discussion actually yesterday with Yeko Stemmet, I'm not sure if he's still here from Fugro, there he is, about also one of the one of the advantages in, in addition to what you've just elaborated was, was also, you know, attracting some of the best talent to, to join Fugro as young professionals. And I think, you know, the decade and this morning, certainly in all of the presentations we heard this morning, there was a really strong focus on youth and early career ocean professional engagement. And having these sorts of initiatives within Fugro is, is also a way of attracting that best talent to, to join. So I thought that was just a really interesting point that came up and yesterday. And diverse talent. And diverse, indeed, indeed. So Ashok, over to you, final word. Just a few thoughts of your perspective on what would success look like for you at UNOC in terms of partnerships? Who is going to be in the room and what are some of the discussions and, and outcomes from these partnerships and, and what is that success looking like in June 2025? This is a whole conference you're asking me to do. <laughs> You have three to minutes, two minutes, in fact. No, 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 I'll, I'll take only one. Uh, <clears throat> first to say that uh, the ocean decade is a model. What you have done, what uh, Vladimir created, what Julian and yourself and your whole team are doing is a model, and it's so much a model that we are happy to announce, thanks to you and, and DG Audrey Azoulay, that uh, we're going to start, the world is going to start uh, a decade for polar science. Uh, and at the heart of your model is this idea of partnerships, public and private, and you have gathered the whole, the whole ecosystem, and not only of uh, the ocean people that we are all, but uh, you have created also bridges beyond the ecosystem of the ocean people who are around the table, uh, and mobilizing countries like Ireland and, and, and France for the two governments uh, represented here. Uh, and that's, that's really a model. So <clears throat> uh, with that in mind, Yes, indeed, because this is the UN Ocean Conference that we are organizing in, uh, in Nice, uh, and this is the third edition of, uh, of the UNOC. I don't know if Peter Thompson is still in the room, but he has created something which, uh, again, has put partnership and science at the middle of, uh, of, um, of action. And we really need all of us to commit to ourselves that we want this UN Ocean Conference in Nice to be a conference of action, uh, a conference of uh, deliverables, of uh, execution of, again, what is on the table, uh, what is already signed or needs to be ratified, like BBNG, etc. But also uh, uh, come up with uh, some kind of disruptions, I would say, because there's no innovation without disruption. And it's not uh, people like you who have created uh, these, these initiatives who will say the contrary. Uh, and so we are still, and we have 18 months in search of, I would say, uh, these really project-oriented, uh, which can go from uh, blue economy to finance, uh, to science, of course. There is one of the deliverables, which is the creation to come back to data uh, of uh, this intergovernmental organization called Mercator International. There are six countries, and we hope there will be many others uh, when that's delivered, the, the, uh, the ocean digital twin. I know there are many digital twins, including uh, in China. I'm looking at my friend over there. Uh, and the aim is not to have a European tool, but a, a global tool uh, for uh, prediction, ocean prediction. And you have worked. Uh, or they have worked for you uh, for the ocean prediction, and I hope that's going to that's going to continue. So, uh, having said that, I think that uh, we have this rendezvous uh, in Barcelona and then in Nice, and that's all that's all we have to be focused on. And thank you very much for and congratulations again for the Ocean Decades work. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ashok, and a big thank you to all our panelists. Um, <laughs> I think some very inspiring words about partnerships, action, and solutions. And with that, we will move on to the next segment of the event, and I will hand it back over to Julian and invite you to take your seats back in the audience. Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, Alison, and, and, and the panel for this great discussion. Uh, so indeed, we are in the last uh, segment of our uh, morning session on the Ocean Decade, and we're going to 
have two more speakers and then uh, we'll ask Peter Thompson to, to close the, the event. But uh, we're going to continue on this discussion on really how we mainstream ocean science through uh, ODA and particularly, you know, focusing on the Global South. So it's my pleasure to uh, invite uh, Mr. Per Frederick Farrow, who is the Director of Climate uh, and Environment at NORAD. And Norway has been playing a, a, an important role in the establishment of a decade. Uh, it was under, under the chair of uh, Peter Haugen, IOC chair at the time, that uh, we actually started to conceptualize a framework of, uh, of, of a decade. But also at the governmental level, uh, Norway is, a, is an active member of the Ocean Decade Alliance uh, through its prime minister, uh, uh, Prime Minister Story, uh, and also has been supporting uh, decade actions in Africa in, in, in particular. So it's my pleasure to give the floor now to, uh, to, Mr. to Dr. Faro uh, for his intervention. No doctor. No doctor. <laughs> Just to be sure. Sorry about that. That's, that's no PhD. Problem. No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, not sure how much I can add after this extremely um, informative uh, discussions. But I do want to say, as a Norwegian, we support all proposals for new taxes. So we're, we're with you, Mark, on that one. Um, I also like to point about the data sets. I think, and this is an issue that comes through in all the elements that we're covering um, in, my, in my department in, in NORAD, with you know, oceans, soils, forests, whatever it is, um, getting the data into interoperable open data sets so they can be used by the private sector, but also by researchers for policy making purposes is one of the crucial tasks that we're facing um, going forward. It's, it's kind of a, uh, a general point. So um, Norway is an ocean nation. Uh, the oceans are part of our identity. Um, and that is um, one of the reasons why, as was pointed out, um, we're one of the founding members of the Ocean Decade Alliance and our prime minister is one of its patrons. Um, we, we really approve of and, and support the decade um, focus on stimulating ocean science and knowledge generation to reverse the decline of this wonderful ecosystem. Um, that all of you uh, know better than me uh, its values and, and how little we know about those values uh, as well. Um, I think all the members of the Alliance uh, ourselves included, are committed to making real contributions um, to this decade. Uh, and I'm happy to announce today that uh, Norway will uh, support uh, IOC with another 10 million Norwegian kroner in um, actually this year, um, assuming it won't be spent this year. But um, that it's a small sum of money, but on a few topics that I think are important to point out, because it also has a little bit to do with the inclusiveness of this effort. So the support will continue to go to the implementation of the Ocean Decade Africa Roadmap, including, including via the Africa um, uh, Task Force, supporting strong engagement from African partners uh, in the 2024 Ocean Decade Conference, uh, and uh, supporting a flagship African event uh, there. We'll contribute to increased support, uh, mentoring, and training to the co-design of future Ocean Decade actions in Africa and also the uh, Caribbean sits. Uh, via a new tailored capacity development uh, program initiative and support the growing global network of early career ocean professionals in Africa and Caribbean sites uh, as well. And lastly, um, we will continue to support the uh, oper operationalization of the Ocean Decade flagship program on sustainable oceans. At the heart of this uh, contribution is, of course, our profound conviction that developing knowledge uh, of the oceans, capacity regarding the oceans, and networks and partnerships regarding the oceans is essential to those ocean sustainable future and thus to the future of our planet. Um, so we look forward to a continued cooperation uh, with you all, with uh, UNESCO IOC and all the members, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Mr. Faro, for this uh, for this intervention, and indeed for for the support of Norway, um, which has been long-standing and and which is very essential to help us to really deliver 
particularly with a focus on seeds in Africa, because we do have a, a certain challenge here. Uh, I think we have less than 10% of decade actions that are actually led by institutions from those, uh, from those countries. So we need to rectify that. Uh, we need to make sure that the decade is fully inclusive, and we need to try to, to provide that capacity and, and support. So as you have heard, uh, Barcelona is going to be the next stop. Uh, for all of us, for the ocean community in its wider sense. Um, so it's really my pleasure to, uh, to invite now a representative from, uh, from the uh, Generalitat, uh, which is the government of Cat Catalonia. Uh, the minister, Subi Subiranas, uh, is unable to attend, but uh, we will hear from uh, Dr. Mireia Boya, uh, who is going to tell us a little bit about uh, the plans for the Barcelona conference and, and how you can all engage. So pleasure to welcome you, madam. Uh, good morning to all. I'm Mireia Boya, uh, General Director of Climate Change of the Government uh, of Catalonia. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, the UNESCO for organizing the side event and for gathering uh, such a remarkable audience with a, a wide uh, diversity of agents involved in the, in the search for specific answers uh, of climate change uh, uh, linked to the oceans a key forum to focus on identifying robust solutions that effectively protect, restore, and manage uh, natural marine ecosystems, creating uh, resilient livelihoods. The challenge uh, of climate uh, adaptation and mitigation is huge, because this uh, is about uh, health, it's about uh, life. Uh, in climate terms, uh, let me uh, say uh, to you uh, that the, the future is not uh, still uh, right, and then uh, we have an opportunity, we still have an opportunity uh, to act. Uh, in Catalonia, we understood uh, from minute one that uh, effective and bold action is needed. And as you may know, uh, now Catalonia uh, is currently immersed in the worst uh, drought in his, uh, its history. In terms of uh, duration, it has been uh, 37 months that uh, it has rained below average in Catalonia, and we are only uh, at 18% um, of um, uh, water uh, supplies. Um, as you know, uh, the next uh, UNESCO Decade of Oceans uh, Program Conference will be held in Catalonia next year. And the government I represent uh, is one of the co-organizers. Uh, we aim to draw up uh, recommendations and present innovative uh, initiative uh, for the achievement of common strategic objective for each challenge of the decade of oceans based on a solid scientific knowledge. This event exemplifies Catalonia commitment to the governance of the oceans and our desire for international projection in this uh, matter. In fact, uh, it's with this uh, celebration um, of the edition of the Decade of the uh, Oceans in our home, uh, in Catalonia, in Barcelona, that we claim to be a maritime country within Europe. Uh, that is why in 2016 we start a path towards uh, the implementation of an integrated uh, maritime policy through the maritime agenda of Catalonia and the different uh, instruments uh, that uh, make it up. Um, well, uh, let me uh, let me fi fi finish uh, this uh, this words, uh, wishing you uh, good luck uh, during uh, these uh, days in this uh, COP28, and uh, hoping and wishing too that you come next uh, April uh, 10, 11, and 12 to, Bar to visit Barcelona, and uh, on this uh, edition of the Decade of the Oceans. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you for, for hosting uh, us uh, next April. And this is going to be a, a full week of event. The conference is a three-day event, but actually the, we are building uh, you know, probably over 120 satellite events that will take place all over the, the city of Barcelona. And the focus here, and, and yesterday uh, Margaret used the, the word self-assessment, and I think uh, it's, a good, uh, it's a good analogy because indeed we are four years into the, the decade implementation, so it's certainly time to celebrate but also to, 
demonstrate what has been achieved, but really starting to focus on where we need to go in the next three to four years. So uh, I really invite you to, to be there. We will have uh, presenting those white papers, which will be, um, you know, which are now being prepared by, uh, by, by the, the science community, but not only, also with, with end users working together to identify those priority areas that will be discussed uh, in, the, in Barcelona. And then that will provide us the bridge to the UNAC process in terms of where we need to invest, where, what are the priorities, so that we can work in 2024 towards having some of those outcomes achieved uh, through partnerships, through commitments, through resource mobilizations uh, at, at the UNOC uh, process. So this is a, a, the last part of our event. And before I, I give the floor to our, our, our next speaker, let me uh, thank you all for, for joining us today. I just want to highlight that there is another ocean pavilion in this uh, building, which is the Ocean Decayed Ocean X Pavilion, which is uh, just upstairs. Uh, please go and see it. It's a, it's a nice venue. We have a nice program for really kind of in-depth discussions on some of those scientific issues with technical equipment, with the RUV there, with nice stuff, nice pictures. So uh, we look forward also to see you upstairs. But now uh, it's my pleasure to give the floor to somebody who has been very instrumental, not only in establishing the UNOC process, but also in encouraging the, the scientific community in 2017 when he was president of the UN General Assembly to push forward with this idea of, a, of an ocean decade. And, and I think thanks to his support and a, a few meetings in the dark basements of the UN Secretariat in New York that in 2017, in December, we, we managed to proclaim uh, this, this ocean decade. And I think this is thanks to his leadership and also his ability to convince uh, governments of a U usefulness of this process, which hopefully will take us to the end. So thank you very much, Peter Thompson, for being with us. And uh, the floor is yours. Uh, UN Special Envoy uh, for the Ocean. Thank you very much for that introduction and the reminder about those dark basements <laughs> in the United Nations. Oh my God. Yeah, and the meetings still go on till dawn. You know, you walk home in the Manhattan uh, mist. Uh, from those meetings, but uh, that's multilateralism, and as you know, it's failing badly in uh, some fronts, the geopolitical one, but it is succeeding magnificently on the uh, environmental front, if you think about things like the Global Biodiversity Framework and the BBNJ Treaty and uh, the, the others that are coming through now, like the Plastic Pollution Treaty and WTO subsidies, uh, harmful subsidies. So it's it's... It's working. Multilateralism is working when it comes to the environmental front, I guess, because there's only one planet and we've got to make it work. Uh, look, first thing I wanted to say is that, uh, you know, don't forget the, the slogan uh, of five minutes, the lady says I've got. OK, you count it down. All right. Hold it up when it says two minutes and I'll start wrapping up. OK, so um, the science we need for the ocean we want. I got that right, right? But what is the ocean we want? Uh, the ocean we want is a healthy ocean. And the fact uh, is that at the moment, the healthy ocean is in decline. And that's observable, and I won't go through it all. You guys know the, 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 the points of decline, but they're everywhere. And uh, we can't have a healthy planet without a healthy ocean. Why do we want a healthy planet? <laughs> because basically we want to survive, right? So the logic of the whole thing sort of fell upon the member states, the United Nations, when IOC UNESCO came to us with this idea of the UN decade, because we realized, you know, we're going to have to do things very differently. Part of that difference probably will be some major uh, geoengineering decisions that have to be made around about 2030. Uh, but we have to make those major decisions on the best available science, and the science just wasn't there. The, the best estimates, and obviously they're just estimates, was that we only knew about 20% of the scientific properties of the ocean. So uh, member states said, yeah, let's have this decade. We agree with IOC uh, that it's necessary. Halfway point, Barcelona. I hear there are over 4,000 pre-registrations, so people have got the importance of the decade. Um, and uh, we roll on from there, of course, the UN Ocean Conference in Nice. Uh, the white papers, uh, as, you, as you've heard, uh, will be a major part of the considerations of the One Ocean Science Congress that it's going to be held in the days before the UN Ocean Conference in Nice, 
where it's expected that a couple of thousand of ocean science the scientists will convene from around the world to discuss not just those white papers but a number of other uh, heavy decisions that are going to have to be debated by them and reported to the UN Ocean Conference the next week so that we can take the new directions that the UN Ocean Conferences usually provide us. They've, the record shows they, they snowball with ideas. So the, that's outcomes from Barcelona. Um, I finance very quickly. Uh, you know, they say that SDG 14 is the least financed of the SDGs, but uh, funny enough, it's the second most successful in achieving its targets. So maybe we just set the targets too low or something. Uh, but you can say the same thing about uh, the UN Decade of Ocean Science because I understand that uh, it's only about that the, that the 50 global programs are only funded to an extent of about 20%. So there's another 80% that has to be uh, funded. Uh, let's do that and, and do that uh, by Barcelona, by the time of Barcelona. So finance, you know, we, we just uh, can't do without it. And, um, uh, you know, on that, again, what a fantastic uh, undertaking this decade has been. Because in spite of that lack of finance and in spite of the tiny team at the IOC, UNESCO, and, and um, I don't want to undermine how tiny you guys are, but you've got two people here. <laughs> the decade would not have happened without these two people here forcing it along day by day. Uh, in spite of that, ocean science is now receiving more attention than ever before in human history, ever before. So, you know, you can thank the decade and uh, IOC for being at the heart of that. So wrap it up. The wrap up will be this. We've got to make a massive pivot towards investment in the ocean, and that is investment in ocean science, and I've just described why we need that for the healthy planet that we want, and we've got the great opportunity to do that investment through the UN Decades Global Action Programs. And the other one is towards a sustainable blue economy, because you know that's what's going to save our children and grandchildren on this overheating planet. Uh, you know, renewable energy and uh, sustainable aquaculture and new forms of health from the ocean, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The sustainable blue economy needs that investment. We have to make that massive pivot now, but we have to do it on the basis of the best science, and the best science is going to come out of this decade. So thank you all for listening. <laughs>